Hello and welcome to this Financial Director web seminar sponsored by Anaplan. I'm Callum Fuller, reporter at Financial Director, and today we're discussing agile planning and forecasting and the ways solutions such as Anaplan's can help businesses do so more effectively. Joining me are each CFO, Strohan Wilson, Chief, Chief Executive of FSN Modern Finance Forum, Gary Simon, and Anaplan's UK Managing Director, Ian Stone. Hello to all of you. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we get underway. You, the audience at home, can ask and submit questions you'd like answered via the eponymous link on the site. Ian, if I could just start with you, uh, what are the limitations of more basic systems like spreadsheets that thousands of businesses up and down the country still use? Yeah, thanks, Callum. I think I think it's worth just starting off by saying that Excel is um, a fantastic personal productivity tool. I think that's really what it was there for originally. And people have extrapolated that and, and used it to build some pretty amazing um, siloed, albeit uh, applications within businesses. I think they really struggle um, when it comes to collaboration. So we're, we're going to talk a bit more about budgeting, forecasting, and um, general sort of planning cycles. But those iterative type cycles where you do you know, require a high degree of participation, emailing spreadsheets around and keeping up to date with the, with the versions is, is very challenging. They're very error prone. So. We've all, we've all used Excel, we understand that D15 times by T23, run a macro and so on is clever, but if you leave the business and hand it on to somebody else, or you need to audit that, it comes with a, with a great deal of challenges. And then as, as, as organisations you know, be, need to become more agile and, and responsive on a more enterprise scale, joining these things up is incredibly difficult. So they're the sort of key areas, whether it be Excel, whether it be Access, whether it even be a legacy planning system. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would add to that, it, it, the key point about budgeting, planning, forecasting is it's a process. Um, and as Ian says, you know, this is a personal productivity tool spreadsheet. So it was never designed to build an application or a process that supports, um, uh, that sits on top of the uh, a application. And so the thing is, you know, as soon as you send a spreadsheet template out to a business unit, you totally lose visibility. You've no idea at the centre what is going on. You've broken the broken the chain. Yeah, and I think that's you know the the, the challenge confronting a CFO in the past was, do you do you accept the agility and the drawbacks from Excel, or do you go for the rigidity and the inability to change of a of a planning system? And it before and historically it was always a an either or. You you either had it and or you didn't, and therefore there was a reluctance to lose that flexibility because planning, whilst it is a process, is also an iterative one yeah. where you benefit from improving year on year. And if you put in a, a historic legacy planning system, that was it. That was all you got and you were worried about the ability to change. And it's only now with the advent of cloud and, the, and providers like Anaplan where you've got the agility and usability mm. of a planning system like and a plan, which is Excel-like in its structure, but you've got the structure and the, the support you have yeah. from enterprise solution. Um, and so you've now got that solution. It's only now really that it, it's empowering the finance function to plan whilst maintaining the flexibility that comes from, some, from, a, from, from Excel. Mm. And, and why would you, you know, invent all the, the functionality again? You know, a, a, a planning system, by definition, has embedded with it within it the specialist functionality that you need for planning. Uh, if you're doing that in a spreadsheet, you're reinventing the wheel and probably getting it wrong as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So how does it help uh, a more advanced system? How does that help you improve your margins? It, obviously, there's a bit more elasticity there, but what specifically can it uh, do to help I think it's back that? to this participation piece again. So whatever business you are, we're talking about it today, but you know, having these people on the shop floor inputting uh, at the grassroots level and pushing data up and also the top down and having that collaboration interaction allows more accuracy. The, the feet on the street, if you like, understand the business more intimately than mm. group finance or central function making assumptions. So I think it's really around the, the, the collaboration, the participation piece. Yeah, no, I think that's that's true. But I think also the, the, the beauty of it is, is the scalability. Mm. So you know, the, whilst Excel is flexible, it is limited by its scale. There comes a point where right. you, you, you either move into separate spreadsheets or you, you open the monster of all spreadsheets and it becomes completely unmanageable. You know, so for, for us, for example, we like to understand um, our margins by store, by product. So we've got you know, 115 stores and 250 products. If you want to do that by week, suddenly your variables become unmanageable in the spreadsheet. And therefore, you make simplifying assumptions from a planning process, which 
may be right, but are pro more likely to be wrong, mm. in, in a, in a cloud-based solution where scalability is simply not a problem, you go to the level that you want to understand it and you let the planning system do the heavy lifting and you get the answer you want. So it allows mm. us to, to truly yeah, know what's happening to our should be simple, shouldn't it? Not yeah. retracting another whole application, just to be yeah. able to drop that new store you just, you, regional Yeah, you move that in. module into the system yeah. and say, actually, today I have that simple assumption because it works, because I've replicated my Excel, but actually I want to, I really want to understand my product margins by store, so build the model and plug it into the side of the module with, with, with a simple Excel type link and there you go, you've got the granularity you want and you're making better and more informed decisions off the back I think that um, high level of participation uh, is really material in terms of the value and quality of the information you get. I mean, you're a retail business, lots of people in different stores, managers in different stores. They're seeing what's going on outside the, the store. So if you've suddenly got roadworks and no footfall uh, across the store, you know, that can be recorded in the next forecast. Um, before, you just didn't have that ability to uh, get engagement with what is actually happening, as, as you say, at the coalface. Because it became planning and that was how it was going to be. The operational decision-making wasn't agile or rapid enough because you couldn't respond to the data. I think that's a really valid... Yeah, it's true. And, and, and also, I think, you know, to the point around engagement, is, is that historically and traditionally, planning is a finance-led function. Um, and as a result, mm. what you end up, whilst finance has a great detailed understanding of what's going on, actually you disenfranchise the rest of the organisation who merely see the output of that process. Yeah. And you only get engagement and buy into a plan if the people who are engaged in it and feel they participate in it. And that's what yeah, exactly. you know, things like Anaplan can do because it's cloud-based, because it's accessible through a browser and because it has a nice front end, you can talk in the language that the functions talk about. Yeah, that's and a very strong engagement. point. You know, driver-based budgeting that takes the complexity away from the front end. I, 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 my first planning application I ever saw was actually uh, the National Union of Farmers back in 1982 doing uh, budgeting in, uh, in VisiCalc on, on, a, on a Commodore PET. And I always say to people, you know, just uh, imagine that your end users are farmers. You know, they're not accountants. They don't want to see grids. They don't want to see complex calculations. They want to see something they can use. And with a cloud-based application that is sensibly configured to use driver-based budgeting so the complexity is behind the scenes and you're talking to them in language they understand, you can build up a very accurate forecast very, very quickly. Yeah, that yeah. data collection challenge is, 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 is mitigated. Yeah. And, and ownership, right? Ownership, so that when you, when you say, actually, these are the numbers we yeah. need to deliver this, this year, people have, have spoken to in their language, they bought in using the variables they understand, and therefore the end result is, it may be an EBITDA number or a profit number, but it's the result of all the input they've had. It's, it's the only way to make a plan stand up. Low quality information from basic systems can harm the attractiveness of businesses to potential investors, can't it? I think it damages all stakeholders, whether you're internal, external, whether you're the regulator looking in. So don't forget that perhaps some of the audience here is, you know, that they're sitting in a regulated environment, relying on putting their hands on the heart and explaining to mm. the regulator where the numbers come from. In reality, I wonder how much confidence there really is and what falls behind in all those processes that get to that final number. So equally, you know, there's the, there's the regulators, there's investors, there's shareholders, but the people actually using these things have their own frustrations. You know, a lot of our phone ringing happens after an annual budget cycle where people have been using these systems, they've been up for days, or they've presented something and the CFO said, actually, I want to look at it in another way. And they have to disappear for another three weeks and pull it all back together. So it's a whole community of, of I think that's right. I mean, I think you know, if I look at my own personal experience of, of, of using Anaplan and the additional granularity we have from it, I believe um, that our investors have greater confidence in us and our ability to deliver the plan, not only because is the plan better built, but the level of detail with which we can speak about the plan and the level of reporting against uh, budget numbers that we can do is much more detailed yeah. Yeah. and therefore it gives an aura of, of competence and therefore a conviction from the, from your investors that actually you know what you're doing and you're heading in the right direction. But, but you don't want your, I, I think the message is that you don't want the, um, the catalyst for this to be you know, investors, there is so much value in doing it yourself. Yes, absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. people should, I don't I mean, you mentioned earlier um, when we were off um, broadcast that, you know, that we've been discussing this for many, many years. Yeah. And it really is, 
there is no excuse anymore. There are very capable and affordable and scalable cloud-based systems, and people need to make that move earlier. Absolutely. And it does give you a distinct competitive advantage, I think, being able to react to the data. We had it recently. We asked somebody to talk at one of our events, a sort of 50 competitors, if you like, and, and the guy just before we started said, do you know what, I'm not sure how comfortable I am. I've, I'm, I'm making a ton of hay out of this. You know, I'm, I'm different, I'm more agile, I can respond quicker. I sometimes don't actually want to share that. So. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Uh, Stora, in, in your case, uh, I mean, there's been rapid growth uh, in the time you've been there. Could you paint a picture of a finance function you inherited in the IT and forecasting system you had uh, bef when you arrived and what you've put in place since? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the environment at EAT when I arrived, what, 18 months ago, was probably very typical of, of IT f and finance functions across the country, is that you know, we, we had evolved a planning solution through Excel because it was a logical place to start. And as we grew as a, as a business, as we added more stores, so additional complexity was added in, we reached the limitation of Excel. So we started going into other Microsoft products. So we started going into Access, and so we started building Access databases. And then we realized we reached the limitation of Access. So we started going into SQL. And then you started realizing that you have a different skill set for each of those. And you get one person who can do the SQL bit, one person can do the Access bit, one person can do the Excel bit. Neither, none of them can do all the bits. Um, so no one really has ownership of it. Everyone has to kind of pull their lever at the right time and make sure that the numbers cascade from one system to the other. And whilst it worked, it was enormously resource intensive. I, I did a kind of quick audit when I first joined the business to say, to work out, you know, wh where is it that we're spending our time and what is it we're spending it on? And I calculated that probably up to 40% of our time was spent on either maintaining or planning within the, the current environment. And that was, you know, whilst planning has a purpose, it should never take up that amount of time when there are so much more that you can do where, in supporting the business. So it was quite clear that you know, we had very big ambitions to grow. Um, it was clear that if we wanted to grow and we wanted to maintain a constant headcount, which is one of the objectives we set ourselves, that the planning system would, would grow exponentially in terms of resource intensity as we grew as an organization, because each new store would add more complexity to an already complex model. So it was clear that we, we needed to, to, to move. And it was clear that um, what we wanted was to, to leverage the internal skill set, which was predominantly Excel-based, an ability to, to, to enable us to have an a, a enterprise strength system, but with the flexibility and, and simplicity of, of, of Excel. And, and you know, we, we, we chose Anaplan, um, which we implemented in three-ish months to fully replicate exactly the planning system that we had. And we now, you know, if I were to do a headcount today, okay, I'm submitting my budget tomorrow, so probably today is not the best day in terms of percentage of time spent on planning. So quite relax though, is that because of the... Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confident I have Anaplan in, so it's uh, delivered me the right numbers, but in terms of total resource uh, across the function, we are probably less than 10%, um, which, is, which is where it needs to be. You, you want to dev devote a, a degree of time um, to it, but not too much. But equally, you know, to the point we were making earlier, it's also not it's not a like for like comparison because the level of granularity we have is significantly higher mm. and therefore the decisions we're making we can trace back to the underlying assumptions and go yeah that must be right because we follow these all the way through so we have a much richer n number we, we're, ca we're confident in making bigger movements from year to year because the underlying assumptions are much more robust um, so yeah, as you say, I'm, I'm submitting my budget to the board tomorrow, and I'm sitting here today. So I'm, I'm confident that the, the system is, is doing its job. <laughs> and you, you've got um, is how many uh, outlets nationwide? So 115, 115 overall. 115, and um, you're seeking to double uh, yes. in quite a short amount of time. Uh, how does a, a, a cloud-based solution uh, help you in that effort? And you know. Can it help you work out where best to target things like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the uh, we so in terms of my eighteen months at, at Eat, the the first year was very much about getting the base business right, because it was clear from a management team that when we started to scale the business at the speed we wanted to go, our focus would inevitably shift from focus on the current business to focusing on the new business, and whilst whilst that was right, we needed to have greater confidence that. The, the core business was being properly managed, properly analyzed, properly viewed, and that we, the wheels wouldn't fall off that while we focused on the future. So 
you know, that, that's why putting in the new planning system was so, so important to us, because it enabled us to say, and enabled me as the CFO, to say with a relative degree of, sim of, of, of simplicity, mm -hmm. yep, the core business is still turning over, the, we're still delivering what we should be delivering, and I can therefore invest my time and my energy, which has historically been on building and implementing the system, mm -hmm. to, to, to the future. Anything either of you like to add to that? I think I'd like to just clear up this whole, you know, cloud system piece. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of badging of, of, of systems um, being term, termed cloud systems. Mm. I think we need to be super precise and say that you know, here we're very much talking about a SaaS-based um, modern system built on the cloud platform. You know, it's sort of buyer beware a little bit in the marketplace right now where you're getting the legacy vendors or um, other incumbents just taking what they have and putting that into a sort of hosted managed service environment. And that's not solving anything really. It might sort out your IT and maintenance costs of the system. But what, what Strand's talking about, and I'm talking about here, is having a, a very agile system that allows you to be flexible, crunch huge volumes of data, and have a, a, have a um, element of governance and control. So you're not just taking the old problem and serving up to your users differently. We're, we've innovated and we're, we're moving the business forward. And yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, there's, there's kind of a couple of key criteria that, that was kind of informed our choice. Yeah. The first was plug and go. So literally, you know, you, you sign on and literally minutes later the, the environment's ready for you to go you can get straight into it mm. and the second is the speed of computation which is you know the, the beauty of excel is its real-time processing capability you change a cell here you see it cascade yeah. through the model sometimes that's a lengthy wait when the model gets too large but it means that when you're when you're putting formula in you can see instantaneously whether or not that they've worked or whether you've made a mistake yeah. and that for that to work on, on, on scale, you really need to leverage the cloud. You really need to leverage your processing capability rather than my processing capability to say, actually, I'm putting this into, I mean, our model is now mm. a billion cells. Yeah. We plug it in today, plug it in now, and literally seconds later I can see, did I make that, did I, did I put it in correctly or, or have I made an error? And then I can change it yeah, exactly. in real time. It's, it's, it's one of the biggest, um, I suppose, advances that I've seen in this market is the computational power that's now available in the cloud in some vendors is uh, very significantly higher and the sort of technologies that are de being deployed um, you know parallel processing in memory computing um, efficient use between uh, um, different kinds of databases it's it's really made a huge difference and so people can uh, work with more granular data and, as you said earlier, actually derive um, faster and better um, business insight from it. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, as a, as a CFO as opposed to a CIO, the underlying infrastructure isn't of huge interest to me, sure. but the results that stem from it massively are. So you know the fact that it's 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 scalable, but as you say, the computational speed. I get the cloud, right? I mm. I get the cloud in that it helps me process quicker and it helps me make better decisions. And as you say, actually, there are a lot of uh, of pseudo clouds out there yeah. who who are effectively only offering me the benefit of IT support without the or, the computational capability. Or worse really still, cloud. multiple clouds. So. You know, the, the issue is that you don't want to have part of your planning activity in one cloud and your budget in another cloud and your forecast in another cloud and, uh, and so forth. And I think that's a real danger at the moment. People are going for non-unified systems. They're selecting, you know, basically a depart manager, departmental manager can buy a bit of cloud processing on, on, a, on his credit card. Mm. Doesn't even hit the departmental budget. And what you end up with is multiple um, disparate, yeah, yeah. Well, we're back to where we were 30 exactly. years ago, uh, uh, and, and, and it's a very real danger, and there's actually been some recent research that's showing just how much time is going to into reintegrating all this stuff. So I think it's an important message that people mm. understand. There are different kinds of clouds, and you want to rest on one particular platform rather than try and do bits all over the place because it's just storing up problems in the yeah. future. I mean, the, ho the holy grail is to unify sales, operations, <coughs> finance, HR under a single... Yeah, system. absolutely. Yeah. Um, pre presumably, though, there are some kind of limitations to <coughs> systems such as these. I mean, um, we've just had a question from a reader which, which asks, um, surely they can only do so much, and if you're putting rubbish in, you'll get rubbish out. It, 
I think you still need checks, balances and governance. And I, and I think, you know, that, that hasn't gone away. Absolutely, the reader's correct. You know, if you put junk into a system, you get junk out. I think what you don't want to do is replicate, which is sort of what Gary was just saying, with multiple departmental um, implementations creating bigger problems. I think with, with the agility of the cloud, with the agility of the system, if you have center of excellence or finance or some clear ownership, stakeholders and governance, that's, that's still important stuff. So you, you can... No, yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely agree. You know, and, and a plan doesn't doesn't do the planning for you, right? <laughs> it, it provides the solution for you to build your yeah. your solution on it. If you build it badly or you you don't think it through properly, you will end up with a bad product. That's not that's not a problem with with Anna planning more. It's a problem with Excel. If you build the right model, yeah. you will get the right answers. Absolutely. Um, uh, and. It, it, it's some, even though it does create efficiencies, growing very quickly, so a business such as yours, um, if you aren't careful, uh, you could end up with inefficiencies still. So how does the data you, you receive help counter it? Yeah, I mean, in, inefficiency is, uh, and is, is, a, is a major problem in our, in our business, and, and particularly, as I said earlier, because the amount of time I now have to correct it, mm. I, is 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 reduced, so I have to have high high degree of confidence that that what we're doing is right, which is why we spent the last twelve months really focusing on on building, implementing, trialing, testing, and stabilizing the system. And you know, whilst it, whilst it is flexible, it is lockable, downable. So in the sense that actually, whereas in a spreadsheet you can you can say right, I'm happy with it, go off and come back, and someone says, oh, I've just tweaked this. And then suddenly you feel there's unintended consequences around the model. The beauty is with Anaplan is, is like any enterprise solution, you lock it down and it's locked down. So I now know that, that the planning system is fit for purpose and it can't be tweaked without uh, the, the requisite authorities and, and change, change and that's management. That's back to Gary's point. You know, that's why you would use a system like this for the workflow, for the authorization, yeah. for that structure, and step away from those yeah, exactly. offline spreadsheet type. Yeah, so I have confidence that you know, it will deliver the same plan if I put the same numbers in it each time I do it, yeah. rather than in a spreadsheet where you always have the, the unknown of what's changed, or did I, did I link it through properly, or you know, Bob has left the business and we hope we, we took down the notes correctly and we didn't and therefore we don't really know what's in there or how it comes out. All that challenge, all that headache, which is fine if, you, if, you're, if you're not seeking to grow as quickly as we are, mm -hmm. you can manage it and, it's, and plenty of businesses do, but I, I simply d won't have the time, and currently don't have the time mm -hmm. to, to spend on doing that. I need to have confidence that we can move forward as an organisation and but we're leveraging all the skills and effort and resource we invested as we prepared for that stage of growth. Anything you'd like to add, Gary? Um, I think it's also there's also a collaboration mm. uh, piece here because um, the dependent the dependability of the information um, is far more pervasive than one particular function now. Um, with the power of these systems, you have the ability to combine, you know, operational and financial data, or perhaps HR with data with financial data. And really the challenge is to make sure that all of those things are consistent. Um, so it is important that, you know, if you're increasing, uh, you know, you're growing, um, that the HR plan says you've got the people to actually sustain that growth mm -hmm. and they're going to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and I think it's that knitting together and that visibility of the overall business that you can now do in one collaborative environment, which is scalable and visible to all the stakeholders in the yeah. business. That is the key point. You've got this larger performance, this larger capability, but to use it to its ultimate end, you have to take a broader view of the business and combine the different functions so that the plans are uh, not de developed independently, but they're developed uh, in a way that they're interleaved um, and the implications of changing a plan in one area ripple through to another area in a consistent way. And it's the same with performance indicators that you get out as part of your planning process. You know, you don't want contrary indicators, something that you do here that has an adverse impact here, but unintentionally. Um, you need to be able to resolve those issues and a, a big unified planning environment with the whole business sharing the same data 
actually well, that's the key. Huge you, know, you spare your blushes. You don't go to a meeting anymore. And we <coughs> talk about lapse rates, and one department calculates it on 13 days, another one's 15 days. You have a single definition of lapse rate, and everyone's looking at the same thing. So, I agree. And actually, the you know the to your point about different timelines, and in, in, in retail tradition, you've always had three planning budgeting models. You've always had the model you do for the company at the at, at the annual level. You've got one you do for the stores, which is a breakdown of that, and then you've got your three, five-year kind of strategy model. And to, your, to exactly that point, historically, you, you, you physically migrate your data, typically in different systems, different processes from one to the other. And the reality is that the models get out of sync because you end up focusing more on this or that or the other. And one of our, one of our objectives, uh, and to, to the point about growing and actually keeping a view of, of what's going on in the world, was we set ourselves the challenge of integrating that we never managed to do that in the past because of the complexity of the challenge and the, scale and the, the cost of, of, of the scale of the model. But because of, of where we are with, 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 with the, the, the cloud and so on and so forth, we said, actually, we think we can. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly where we are today. So today, we have real-time view of store level, company level, and three-year level at, at the same time. We change one variable, so we change our, you know, our, our margin assumption, our input price assumption, and it, it cascades through the model real time so that we always know how we're looking on a three-year horizon, one-year horizon, and a, and, a, and a kind of individual store perspective. Yeah, and the, and the value in these processes is not so much, you know, the end is getting the numbers, but the value tends to be in the thinking of the process that yeah. to arrive at those numbers and engaging with different people in the business to think about it. And it's that which creates the accuracy and understanding and the ownership, I think you said earlier, um, about the, the budgets or the forecast. People have much more confidence because they can be involved now. The, yeah, you know, the, 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 the capability is there to allow everybody to get involved. And, and the possibilities are quite exciting, aren't they? So, so we have a very large global insurance company who acquired another very large global insurance company recently. And the due diligence and the sort of post-acquisition roadmap was driven through the Anaplan model, being able to pull the data in through the DD process, analysing it, integrating it and working from it. I mean, you, before that would have been armies of people yeah. crunching away in spreadsheets, databases and some wild assumptions made. And it's, it's, it's been a very clean... Yeah, and I think that's, that, that's really what, what has evolved over time is, is that the distinction of a planning solution, that yeah. kind of the beast in the corner that had its yeah. handle cranked overnight and spat yeah. out the numbers in the morning, yeah. is no longer. And long may it stay that way but as you as you operationalize your financial data and so you start talking to other functions in the language which with they they run their part of the business so there is a request for extensions of that model into their world mm. so they say well actually you know what headcount management we were discussing it earlier <coughs> is a classic you know you, you 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 spit out because you're looking at the you're trying to model your 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 fine, your salary cost, but you you get headcount as a, as an output of that, and you can cut that and slice and dice in whichever way. Mm -hmm. And suddenly your your people or your HR function are saying, oh, that's very interesting. Actually, I can do separate workforce management planning extensions off the back of that, and so you, you can extend it in that way. And, and there's a value to the the central finance function because if they're using that every day, all day in day out, then the the planning exercise disappears because it's, it's constantly updated it's current and it's and it's and there's a value to them as well as a value to you so you, you start extending the functionality and different parts of the business are talking in their language using the same unified system across multiple time horizons and you you, you, you suddenly got one system that can real time tell you wherever you are in the business what you want to know when you want to know there it. used to be the the challenge that um you know, in a, in a spreadsheet environment, that basically the the reporting entity, be it a branch or a subsidiary or whatever it is, or a shop, um, did its piece, sent the data to the centre, and had no incentive or interest in what was going on thereafter. Um, but we don't have to make those compromises anymore. No. You can actually allow people to have this continuous access and to focus on the analysis of the business rather than you know, manipulation of, of the numbers. And uh, I think that's been a critical change. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and therefore empowers the whole business <coughs> to, to get better and to give greater insight into where we're heading. We've had another question uh, from an audience member. Uh, we would like to know what the panel make of uh, the application of external data, such as macroeconomic trends, 
and competitive behavior uh, through cloud and uh, SaaS systems. Yeah, I mean, so it's a, it's a very important point. Um, <clears throat> we, we've seen that particularly in, in elements of sales performance management. You know, some of our clients are using it to, when, when they make commercial decisions about whether there should be discounting or trade promotions, benchmarking against Nielsen data or competitive data and pulling that in and being more informed, even looking then at the compensation of the people involved in the transaction to see where, whereabouts they are. So, yeah, enriching uh, your, your analysis through external parties and, and data sources is a massive area from a competitive advantage, but also what we talked about earlier, you know, bringing stuff up from the shop floor. Even that, to an extent, has not been um, done very widely before. It's, uh, I mean, um, a very exciting new area, uh, it is very new, is social media analytics. Yeah. So using uh, data about uh, comments and uh, opinions in blogs and uh, in uh, discussion forums and uh, other sources of information, uh, tweets and so on, to actually impact on um, on forecasting. So you're launching a new product in an area, what are people saying about that in social media? And there are clever algorithms for turning that into numbers and then using those numbers to inform the forecast as well. And that's a, a rapidly developing strand, if you like, of using um, competitive information to uh, understand the business better. Yeah, and I think, I think it, it, it kind of opens up an area that, that is, we're kind of examining at the moment, which is because we have effectively infinite scalability of the resource and we have effectively infinite computational capability, there's, there's no limit to the granularity to which we can go. The limit is our capability to actually know what to do with it. Mm, so we're yeah. moving from the world of finance planning and analysis into data scientist territory. So you start saying, actually, I can get variables from wherever I want, right? The, the, the beauty of the cloud and beauty of the internet is that actually you can get data, you can get data on pretty much what you want. Some you have to pay for, some it's free. But then you start saying, okay, I'm getting all these data sources. I know that they're, they're, they're influencing my output, but it's beyond my capability to know how to how to factor that into the model. So you, you, you're beyond the cap you, What you're doing is you're extending the functionality of a finance function into into you know proper kind of data scientist quant kind of territory, um, which we're we're doing on on our on our suggested forecasting. So we, you know, one of the key areas yeah. for us is is we need to know. How many, because most of our products have a one day shelf life, what, how many products should we buy and stock on the shelf tomorrow? And the number of variables you need are you know, weather, tr trend, history, lots and lots of variables, which a simple multivariate regression simply isn't good enough. Yeah. And, that's, and then you, you go into a whole new territory of. of but it's of a fantastic model. thing, yeah. isn't it? I mean, yeah. traditionally, the problem's been you couldn't do that. Yeah. Just stuffing yeah. spreadsheets into a system or getting data from the system, it's been all your time doing that. This, yeah, and I think this is where the competitive advantage piece yeah. is coming from. And you're fully empowered. Yeah. You're fully empowered. Yeah. You're only limited by your own capability. It's and disappointing to have met it. Uh, yeah, yes, well, the, 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 yes. Uh, that's a key point. Yeah, I think what we're discovering now is there is a huge shortage or an emerging shortage for sure of those so-called data scientists yeah. and there have been some pretty alarmist figures about it. But in the short term, where do businesses look for analytical skills? finance function mm. uh, and so we're picking up you know those um, demands for for analysis but uh, you know you're absolutely right the capability is there you know we've now got to take skills you know because it's not all about technology no. we've got to take skills no. to use it yeah. um, for that competitive advantage which is mm. sort of sitting there yeah, if we could move things on to uh, supply chain, Strowan, of course, you deal with a lot of perishables and that makes it Im imperative for you to manage the supply chain well. Yeah. Um, how difficult is that and uh, <coughs> how's the introduction of uh, the new system improved that? Yeah, so, so I mean, yeah, as I was mentioning earlier, the, the, the challenge in our business is, is the one day shelf life of the product. So if we don't sell it, we give it to charity, basically. Um, so. Which, which has a, a significant cost to the business. So actually getting the right number of products on the shelf at the right time is enormously important to us. And historically, our you know, it starts with your sales forecast. If you have a good idea of what you're going to sell, you've got a good idea of what you're going to have to need to order. Um, and 
historically, because we were using spreadsheets, really the sales number was, well, last year I, I did this. I reckon I'll probably do a couple of percent more. Therefore, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. But that, that was about as complex as it got. You, you could you know, sit around pontificating at length about why it was that number. Mm -hmm. But the reality was it was just taking last year's number and, and, and improving it. What we've now got is we've got, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, our, our product sales by store by, by, by line, by week. So we know across the estate what each product will be in each store because whilst it's a big calculation, it's not a massively complicated one. Um, and therefore, because we now know what that volume is, it makes the whole supply chain much easier from, from, from two sides. One is actually when I say to the supply chain team, how much is it going to cost me next year? There's two things. One, I've given them the volume of mm. what we're going to sell by ingredient. And, the, and then they can talk to me in their language, which is cases and case rates. Mm. I then plug that into the model, crank it through the recipe, which mm. we've put into the system. And so I now know the cost of sales accurately because it's a build up of the prices that the supply chain team have negotiated, one. The second is that then when they're buying it, they, they can buy out knowing they can, they can commit to certain volume com, um, commitments because they've done their own kind of variance analysis on, on our, our volumes and said, actually, that I have every reason to believe I will be able to deliver that. So they can buy better, they can buy more efficiently, mm. and therefore they can buy ultimately cheaper. And there you go, you know, procurement, marketing with promotions, you know, yeah. sales. It's completely interlinked. Supply, it, it, but that, it, goes, it, it yeah. goes even further than that. A lot of the retail business is sharing that data with external providers. Yeah. So your suppliers, I mean, I don't know if you're, you've gone that route yet, but actually sharing some of that demand data with your suppliers and actually seeing, you know, which suppliers can cope with it and where you've got to source it from different um, suppliers is also uh, something that's possible. You know, the cloud, it's easier to share that data and be more efficient with the supply chain very directly. And because you've converted it into the language which they speak, yeah. you know, you're not talking pounds and pence, which is the language of finance, you're yeah. talking cases, volumes, yeah. ingredients, SKUs, uh, which, which they're comfortable with. And you know, the system does the conversion yeah. to translate it from what, you know, a supply chain number to a finance number. And it's a big calculation, but you only need to set it up once and it then runs forward. Um, so you, you get that level of insight and you can deliver genuine quantifiable benefits from, from yeah. the implementation. Make adjustments as you go. Uh, exactly, of course. Of course. Uh, we've had another question from an audience member, uh, Ramneet Bassi from VU. Um, they'd like to know, uh, well, th this all seems very good for the operational side of things, but what about the corporate side and dealing with multi-currencies, M&A and so on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's an inherent part of our system. Most of our organisations are multinationals um, across many different geographies and regions. So intercompany currency is, is, a, is a sort of day-to-day -day piece of our, our life, really. And, and again, quite neatly controlled. So we would have central assumptions around those currencies, around those rates and so on. All the operating models hanging off of that and then one place to adjust and, and flex and, uh, and move. Yeah, I mean, I, and obviously EAT is, is London-centric, yeah. so the total number of currencies required is one. Yeah. But actually, I, before coming to EAT, I was at Burger King and, and I was running the, the Northwest European division of Burger King with Anaplan in multi-currency across multiple currencies. And I, I completely agree with you. It's, it's just another dimension. You lock down your currencies, you put the calculations in to translate it. It's, it's fine, it just yeah. it operates in the background and doesn't stand in the way of any complexity. And in real time as well. Yeah, so of course, in real time, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're running out of time. Our 40 minutes is fast approaching, so we've got time for uh, one or two more questions. Um, how does uh, a system such as Anaplans help you size up potential acquisition targets? Yeah, um, like I spoke about earlier, you know, it gives it gives the acquirer real insight into what they're taking on. Um, so it allows you to make that go no go decision by understanding the impact and the synergies of that transaction, um, and then not only. In, in acquiring, but also then the sort of BAU stuff to to see those changes through. So, yeah, absolutely, that's called sort of. I, I think that's you know it, it reflects the Excel-like nature of the yeah. tool. Is you know, M and A is basically done in a spreadsheet. Always has been, yeah. always will be, and exactly all the same limitations that exist in a planning cycle exist in an M and A acquisition. That's right. You're more time constrained because typically your timelines are short. But actually, yeah. the reality is that 
if you can leverage what you've already built on your own business in Anaplan, yep. you can extend that functionality very quickly into the acquisition target because half all the engine is, is built and it's just saying, actually, well, if I buy this and it does that, can I embed it in and actually what's the value? What are the synergies? What are the cost savings? What are the headcount requirements? It's all there. It's all built. Mm. It's all ready for you. Yeah, I mean, one of the big um, challenges in M&A has been, okay, you acquire the business. No one thinks about the systems afterwards. With a cloud-based system, you can just roll out the same yeah, forecasting yeah, system as well. Yeah. So it's like a win-win. You, yeah. You're buying the business. You know more about it before you buy it, and they can use the same system. Yeah, exactly. Any organisational <laughs> flexible chain, not just acquiring, but reorganising. Yeah. Yeah, we have some very large organisations that have changed their units down to cells or different operating divisions. Again, you know, chart of accounts in, in, in the traditional places, mm. how will that business look if we start to move divisions around and, and put them under umbrellas? So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're out of time, guys. Uh, thanks so much for coming in. Um, we just need to thank uh, Anaplan and uh, you, the audience at home for watching and uh, the rest of our panel, Stroh and, and Gary. Thanks ever so much for coming in. Mm. Um, and join us next time. Goodbye. <laughs>